Welcome to the season premiere of Worth Repeating. I'm so happy you guys are here. You can clap, you're excited. I just want to first thank our sponsors. You know, Worth Repeating would not be possible without the 8020 Foundation. Clap it up for them. Real L Brewing Company, clap it up for them. And our newest sponsor, uh, Texas, well, I don't want to mess it up, Texas A&M University San Antonio. We're so proud to have them aboard. Additionally, I want to thank my marketing team, Bobby, Elisa, Rob, Noah, Krista, and KQ. Let's clap it up for them. They're killing it every day. <laughs> Along with my storyboard who helped me craft this show that you're going to see today. So these are volunteers that give their time and we're just so proud of them. Clap it up for the storyboard. We're so proud of everything they've done in bringing you this program. Now tonight, we present Awkward. <laughs> Stories about chagrin, those red hot cheeks, and just a time that maybe you just didn't fit in. And part of that story process is going to be cued by the gentleman you see here playing piano, Kenneth. Can you guys clap it up for Kenneth? Now, every time a storyteller reaches seven minutes, Kenneth is going to play a trill to cue them that sounds like. And then the hook will come out, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, and then they'll know that it's time to wrap it up. Now they may go over, they may go under, but we get to hear that little trill each time they hit seven minutes. So that'll be nice for them. And now I want to introduce my co-host. I'm not hosting this alone. He is a storyboard member. Let's all give a warm welcome to Dr. Thomas Porter. Hello, Tori. Hello, Thomas. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thomas, what do you think about the show we prepared today? I think it is a little awkward. <laughs> Have you and ever felt awkward? I've noticed that you invited me to be the co-host during awkward. <laughs> yes, I do have an awkward experience. I live inside Loop 410. In Loop four, inside Loop 410 is a little store where I get these little red grapes little chunks of cheese, flat pretzels, and t herbal tuna. I had, I had my food and I was headed home in my car. I drove into my hood, turned down my street, put the blinker on in my car, and I noticed in my driveway there were no cars. Someone had stolen my freaking car. I slammed on the brakes and I could hear a little click, 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 click. I thought, what is that sound? Oh, it's my blinker. I'm in my car. <laughs> I'm the one who stole my freaking car. <laughs> Awkward. Now, we have a bevy of awkward storytellers. We do. Uh, none that uh, riveting. <laughs> is, is that what it is? <laughs> riveting. Yeah. Oh, Porter, we're going to have fun. With that, guys, I want to introduce you to our first storyteller of the night. Edward Guadalupe Acuna Lucio Cody Jr. Put your hands uh, together. Wait, wait, wait. What? what? Just start. <laughs> or, yeah, let's put our hands together. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glad to see everybody. This doesn't count for my seven minutes. <laughs> don't start. You know, there's one thing that I really don't enjoy or didn't enjoy about visiting my abuelos in Corpus Christi the heat. 
Man, it gets hot down there on the coast. And they only had one fan. And, and that fan, usually my wella had it. Because she, cause she took it in the kitchen where she was always working, you know. You know how wellas are, right? She'd do that masa for tonight's tortillas. Mmm, delicious. Well, my wella was a beautiful woman. She had these fiery, dancing brown eyes right in the middle of that caramel-colored complexion, flawless. And a widow's peak right up the middle of her India ink hair. Gorgeous, beautiful woman. All the comadres hated her because <laughs> she looked so good, you know? And the other reason they hated her was because she really knew how to give out chancla justice. <laughs> oh, man. Now, my abuelo, he was totally different from la abuela. He was short, he was slightly built, and he seemed much, much older than her. Okay, but, you know, she married him, so that's okay. <laughs> well... My willow's complexion, though, belied his Tex-Mex heritage and his position here on La Dicinueve. He was as white as the guys that he worked for down at Swanter and Gordon. That's an insurance office, and he was the janitor. And he'd take me with him sometime. So when we'd go, the, it was hot, so hot. And I'd say, Wello, it's hot. And he'd say, see, mijo, there's those ways, no, no, no tienen vergüenza. They turn off that air conditioner to save money. They don't worry about me. But you know what? It's okay. Because Wello had figured out how to turn it back on. <laughs> well, the office there <clears throat> was a beautiful, exciting place for a young man to be. The owners went to Africa every year on safari. And what they had done is they had decorated the whole place with their prized trophies. There were tigers, there were hyenas, water buffalo, anything you could think of all on the wall. And they had even a pair of elephant legs that had become the basis for a coffee table. Man. <laughs> so that was what I did. I pretended to be the brown hunter in the Serengeti. <laughs> well, my wello did the work of emptying the trash and, you know, vacuuming and all that. It was just amazing what we did. The other thing about that office that was wonderful, they had the founder's pictures on the wall. Good, you know, nice-looking gentleman with suits and all, and I always wondered, you know, if you put a suit on my wello, he would look just like them. Why are they rich? And why is he the janitor? Who decides these things? Wow. Imagine a little kid thinking that, you know. So, as I go in the kitchen to talk to Wella, and I look out the door, I see my Wello. He's out in the, in the back there of the yard under the china berry tree. He's wanting to escape the heat and the kitchen where my Wella rules. So he goes out there and turns on the radio and listens to his favorite, Los Yankees. <laughs> so I tell my Wella, Wella, I'm going to go outside and see what Wello's doing. So I head to the door and I just throw it open and head out and boom, it hits hard. You remember that. And I hear my Wella. Huerco <laughs> jodido! So I just smile and laugh and head on out there. And so there's my huelo. And I get up on him, and he is snoring. Man. He could snore. I swear. Those notes of his were high and low and all over the place. Reminded me of the Chicharra song. <laughs> I loved it. I was just amazed watching him. How could all these events come to a confluence and come out as this wonderful snore? You know, if there was a contest, I could enter my wello. 
he would be the champion of 19th Street. Or, even better, the champion of the whole world, just like his Yankees. <laughs> so there we were. Well, I was watching him and thinking, wow, what's going on? Well, next moment I see a webworm coming down from the tree, just coming down from the tree, and I'm going, wow. I think that webworm is wanting to challenge my wellow's snoring. Because, you know, the webworms had taken over the neighborhood. And when they do that, man, it looks like cotton candy in all the trees, right? Yeah. But my wellow, he had designated himself as a champion for the neighborhood. He came up with a flamethrower. He took an old fleet insect. Some of you may be old enough to remember that. And he would fill the bottom when he was ready. When he was ready to go out there and get rid of those webworms, he'd fill the bottom with gasoline. Wow. <laughs> and every once in a while, when I would go with him, he would let me help him. Just a week or so back when we'd gone out there, he let me not just light the rag on the end, but pump the thing too. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> Those worms <laughs> falling down. It was crazy. Well, I said to him, Viejo pendejo, lo vas a matar a Junior. <laughs> he started taking off because he knew what was coming next, okay? Yeah. She reaches for her chancla and, whoa, smacks him because he couldn't get out of the way. Man, that can't be seven minutes. So we keep going. <laughs> we, keep, we keep going. So here's the next thing. I'm going to fast forward a little bit because it sounded like almost seven minutes, right? Anyway, I was in the back. I couldn't hear it. So anyway, <clears throat> I see the webworm. He's coming down. All of a sudden, he decides to go back up. And I'm thinking, no, man. Come on, little guy. Stay, stay, stay and fight. Okay? But no, he didn't listen. He's still going up the web. So I just grab him real quick. And in one swift movement, whoosh, I throw him over at Wello's gaping mouth. <laughs> oh. And it lands. <laughs> And my poor well, <laughs> he just fell over the side of his chair like a great ship going down from a kamikaze attack. Whoa. So I'm all excited. Yay, webworms. Yay, webworms. Well, he jumps up. <laughs> and he's coughing. And <laughs> he manages to spit it out. That little worm is just tumbling through the air, and he's covered with all kinds of stuff, spit and phlegm and other unidentifiable liquids. Man. Well, Wello jumps up, and with his right foot, boom, he smashes the well worm. But he looks so pitiful, my Wello got spit on him, and his eyes are red, and there's stuff coming down his chest. We don't even know what it is. And then all of us, at that moment, I felt so bad that I had abandoned him and gotten over the webworm side. <laughs> oh, man. So, went to the dark side, yes, yes. But that's okay because all of a sudden, sus! I feel the sensation of a chancla on my nalgas. Whoa! <laughs> well, I had apparently been at the, at the kitchen door looking out, and she saw the whole attack of the webworms. And I was, whoa! And then again, sus! A second hit on my buttocks. So at that point, I started running like Joe Pepitone round in third to avoid the next chancla justice. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Wow, what do you think of that, Porter? Sometimes you get caught putting things where they don't belong. <laughs> but it was high protein, you know, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> Delicious. <Very good. laughs> 
You want to tell us about our next storyteller? Well, our next storyteller is Martha Zapata. She has a piece of information that someone gave her that could have set back her journey. But with determination, she ended up right where she belonged. Let's all welcome to the stage, Marta. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm going to try to follow that, but it's going to be a little bit hard. So um, I'm in ELL, so bear with me. For the ones that don't know what an ELL means, is that I'm an English language learner. So I have my cheat sheet right here with me. So. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, growing up, I was the type of person uh, that loved school so much. I know I was a little bit crazy <laughs> and still am because I still love school very much. Uh, for instance, I never had a B in Mexico in my school career over there. Uh, I was always an A on a roll student. Um, I never considered myself like a bookworm or anything like that. But um, I just guess I had, you know, good memory and could absorb information easily. So therefore, I, you know, my aspirations were a little bit high. And I always dreamed of, you know, going to university, uh, having a professional career, you know, and, and be successful. Or whatever that meant, you know, successful man. <laughs> so, um, but I do would like to point out that um, I do come from a family of a very determined woman. For instance, uh, my grandmother became an orphan at, in, at age six. Yeah, very young. So ever since then, she had to work really, really hard to uh, first find a place to live and provide for herself. And then eventually, when she became an adult, to um, provide for her seven children. And so um, at one point, uh, she was when she was an, already an adult, she was working at a factory in Mexico. And... Uh, one, uh, one of her, her fellow uh, friends at the uh, work factory told her to, to enroll in, a, in this raffle because they were going to uh, raffle an apartment. She thought she was never going to have a chance or anything like that, but nevertheless, she, she you know, uh, point, noted herself and, you know, in, the, in the book, and, and to her surprise, she won the raffle. So um, that was just a, a, you know, a, p a turning point for her. Eventually, um, you know, my grandmother being an entrepreneur woman, she uh, set up a convenience store in one of the rooms in the, up in the new apartment that was facing the street. And she uh, was, you know, r running the store simultaneously uh, as when she was working at the factory. So it was, it was a hassle, but her, you know, her daughters and, and which my aunts, <laughs> they helped her. So it was a little bit easier. But then eventually that... Um, business bloom, and she was able to quit her job and dedicated herself to, to that, you know, uh, convenience store. And as I was growing up, I was able to help her a little bit more at the, at the convenience store. And that was just one tale of survival uh, that happened among my family. But my tale of survival started when I came here to the U.S. as a newcomer. I... Um, wanted to, of course, learn English and to continue my education because, uh, you know, like I said, I wanted to fulfill my dream. But I didn't know anything about how the educational system worked here in the U.S. or, you know, how to even start. But nevertheless, I uh, stayed in high school for two years. And as I was learning a little bit English, I was able to express myself uh, a bit more in I started expressing to a couple of friends or people that I thought I, that were my friends my desire to to go to college and to continue my education. But that's when I uh, I uh, started, you know, noticing bad comments that discouraged me greatly. One of them was well, the first thing they asked me, which I thought it was weird at the begin at that moment. Um, they were like, "Well, do you even have a social security number?" <laughs> and I was like. Uh, Nope. <laughs> I, I didn't even know what that was, so I was like, nope. <laughs> so um, and they were like, oh, okay, then you can go to college. I mean, you, you, you can just probably finish high school, but that's it. You can't, you can't do that. But um, at, at the moment, I never actually thought much about it because I was like, oh, they're young like me. You know, they don't know much about it either, probably, so they're just probably lying. 
So later on, I, you know, uh, I wanted to consult to, you know, adult people about it because that stuck kind of like with me. You know, I didn't say much, but it kind of stuck with me. So um, to my surprise, uh, older people told me, oh, no, honey, if you don't have a social security number, you can go to college. If at the max, you could probably work at McDonald's or something like that, maybe clean houses, but that's it. So that was a very huge disappointment for me. Because I thought that, you know, everything that had, I had done until that point was for nothing. So that discouraged me greatly. So um, when I found out that, you know, uh, I wasn't going to have, more, you know, a chance to actually fulfill my dream of, you know, becoming a professional, I was like, well, then screw this. <laughs> I'm leaving high school. So I dropped out of high school. And then I pursued my second dream goal that I had, which was to become um, a mom and to have a family of my own. So I got married, and then I have four children. And while working at jobs here and there, I tried to provide, you know, for my family and everything, um, I involved myself in, in my, uh, my children's education as much as I could. You know, I was the type of mom that I was always in, like, the PTO meetings and, and activities and events and helping, volunteering, you know, all, you name it. I was there. So my children became my driving force. But fast forward 10 years later, I completed, I completed all the requirements for my GD. I got my GD. And then um, later on, I was able to obtain my Social Security number. And guess what? I did, the first, you know, as soon as I got it. I enrolled in college, <laughs> so in a community college, yes. Um, thank you. Well, uh, in college, I was in my third semester when uh, one of my friends shared with me that she didn't have a social security number, but this is in my third semester, right? So <laughs> uh, later on the same day, a teacher shared that in order to attend college or university in the, uni in the U.S., you don't have to have a social security number. So, <laughs> exactly. I just froze. <laughs> I froze, and, and I, I mean, literally, it took me a minute to react. I, I was just like flabbergasted. You know, my jaw dropped, and I was like, what? <laughs> uh, so... Uh, that was definitely a very awkward moment for me because I, I didn't even know what, what to do. So, but you know, all, at that moment, everything started coming to my mind, you know, like all those memories, if I had known this before, you know, why did people this, um, you know, told me this or misguided me on purpose. So I wonder how cruel someone had to be in order to do that, you know? But um, anyways, many things were going through my mind at that moment, but nonetheless, what stuck with me that if I just had known that information at the time when I needed it, you know, who could have known? Like I could have spent all that time studying, not dropping out of high school, but going to college instead. And, um, but um, needless to say, so I finished um, uh, my university career. I graduated at UTSA with a bachelor's degree. Now, now in the middle of my master's, um, I'm, I, I like to advocate for immigrants' uh, rights, and I like to you know, spend my time educating people and, and helping others uh, with the process of, of college you know, applications and scholarships and things like that. So. That's what I do. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, just a piece of information, and it derailed everything. But didn't she do a good job getting it back on track? She is amazing. <sighs> wow. Okay. Our next storyteller is Raquel. Cataldo. Raquel is here to share her story about how most things in life, you can't trust the wrapping, no matter how pretty the packaging. Put your hands together for Raquel Cataldo. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? I think it's the right height. So I was born in South Texas on a border city. And my dad was a, a mason, but he learned to lay bricks since he was eight years old, working alongside his dad. 
and he became a master of carpentry, everything. And so this man came to our hometown to start and build a new district, and he heard about this, you know, really great man, and he wanted someone to get help him out in the school district, and he offered my dad a job as a janitor to also help support the building. So my dad was a lot of us, and he needed insurance, so he took the job. And uh, Mr. Brantley, the superintendent, you know, really saw my dad's worth, work ethic and what he knew and was very impressed by it. So he said, you know, I would like for you to become a building trades teacher in our district, and I want you to First project is you're going to build a house on school property with your high school students. So my dad did it, and um, that house, he said, I'd like for your family to live in. He said, because I want your kids to go to the good schools. So uh, we lived in a little house on school property in the nice neighborhood in my hometown. So um, across the street moved in this family, the Newtons, the nicest lady, and she had two young girls. And they were younger than me, but they were super friendly, and it was August, and it was, you know, close to my birthday. And so naturally, the kind thing to do was to invite them. So I did, and they came to my birthday party. And the Newtons were living in this nice house, but they were kind of wealthy, and so they were building this super nice house somewhere else. So they were like in an interim stage. And so I, uh, they came to the birthday party, and they came with the most beautiful birthday gift that I had ever seen. I mean, it was from a fancy department store in my hometown. They had this beautiful paper and this gorgeous bow. And then you know those, they used to have these labels from the department store, a gold label. So I was super excited and I wanted to open that gift and I couldn't wait. So uh, time to open presents. I was so thrilled and I, to this day, I really wish, hope rather, that my expression when I opened the gift that it doesn't show what I really felt. <laughs> because I opened that gift and out came the ugliest pantsuit that I had ever seen. <laughs> and when I went to school in fourth grade, girls couldn't wear pants unless it was a pantsuit. And so the pants were black kind of, you know, uh, bell-bottom legs with black with yellow, red, and white flowers and a little lace trim at the bottom. <laughs> The, uh, the, the blouse had the matching the pants here, but really cool effect, yellow opposing on the body, <laughs> and the same kind of colors, and then just to give it the perfect touch, it had a red belted satin little belt. I mean, thank you, and I hope I was polite, I don't remember, but that outfit <laughs> went directly to the back of the closet, never to be seen or worn again. Well, school was about to start, but the Newton girls invited me to their house to play, and I thought, Mom said I could, and I went over there, and she said, oh, no, mija, get back in there and put that outfit on. <laughs> que, que pena that Miss Newton would think that you didn't appreciate it. I'm like, Mom, please. I was in fourth grade, Mom went out, so there I go, put the outfit on, go to play at the girls' house. It seemed a little too fancy for the occasion, but, <laughs> but I had to go with it, so, I go, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. So fast forward, it's now Halloween. And in those days, kids could wear costumes to school. And uh, I wasn't wearing a costume, I was just gonna go. And mom said, que pena, once again, that Miss Newton would think you don't appreciate this outfit. You better wear it, you're having a party today. I'm like, mother, por favor. And she's like, get in there. So I go in there and I put on this outfit and I go to school begrudgingly passing right in front of Ms. Newton's house on the way to school. Luckily, I was really close to the campus because I was on school property. And, um, <laughs> and I got to school quickly. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, they had a party. And the principal, Mr. Herrera, would stand in the middle and all the kids would parade around with costume. Well, I didn't have a costume. I'm standing to the side. And this girl with this adorable uh, pumpkin costume, her name was Claudia. I'll never forget her or forgive her. <laughs> She says, get in here, you could be a clown. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. I could not run home fast enough. And so I was so angry, it went further into the closet, and that was it. I was done with it. So now um, that fancy department store, my grandmother was poor, but she prided herself in taking care of her little money, and she got her little credit card from that store. But she only shopped there for very special occasions. 
and uh, for, you know, it had to be a special gift and all that. And my mom, and she would go shopping uh, at that department store. You know, it was a Saturday thing before the malls, right? And so she went down there, and they're in that department store looking around. They said, let's look at the girls' department. So they go down there, and my, she says, Mama, Raquel wore this outfit to school. Look at it. And she's, like, confused. And they're looking at it and checking things out. Here comes a sales lady, and she says, Señorita, son pijamas. <laughs> so the sales lady says, uh, Sí, son pijamas. <laughs> At that point, my mother and my grandmother are losing it in the department store. I mean, bent over crying. The sales ladies are like, these ladies are weird. <laughs> and, and so she says, um, yeah, sí, son curiosas las pajamas. There are funny pajamas. And they're like, no, that's not the funny part. The funny part is my daughter wore these to school. <laughs> And then, then, so now the sales lady's laughing, right? And everybody's having a good old laugh at my expense. I'm at home, you know, I don't know anything that's going on. My mother probably got a speeding ticket that day coming home because she could not wait to gather all six kids <laughs> and tell everybody how I wore pajamas to school. And so, oh my God, I wanted to die. To this day, that's kind of a family joke. Remember when Raquel wore pajamas, ha, 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 you know? And, uh, but you know, all these years, I have wished that I would never see Miss Newton. I mean, what must that woman be thinking? You know, and I'm thinking, I was at your house at three. Could you have called my mother? You know? And, uh, but no, but today, I wish I do run into Miss Newton. I want to clear my good name. <laughs> I knew there was something wrong with that outfit. No chance, I haven't seen her yet. <laughs> Oh, man, aren't moms the worst? <laughs> I kind of like that outfit. <laughs> you would. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, our next storyteller is Mitzi Moore, and Mitzi has come to share a story about... <laughs> a crush? A crush that really lived up to his name. And we call this a very karma-esque sort of reunion. Guys, put your hands together for Mitzi. Hello. I um, am sort of an expert on the theme here today, the theme of awkward, because I was a high school and middle school teacher for 34 years. I have witnessed a lot of awkward. I'm retired now. Um, but I know there are some of my former students in the audience. I don't want you to worry. The story is not about you. <laughs> Instead, you're safe. It's a story about <clears throat> my awkward adolescence. You see, when I was 14, as most of us are, I was, I was pretty awkward. My family had just moved to the city, to Austin, and I knew about two people on the first day of school. And I was chubby, and I had glasses, and I had stringy hair, which was not cute in the 80s. And anyway, um, where was I going? Oh, I also did not really know how to dress. Um, despite spending many hours with fashion magazines. And one thing you need to know about me, when I was a freshman in high school, I was extremely boy crazy. And sadly, they never liked me back. So, but it, it was okay. I spent the year making friends. I was in the junior varsity marching band. And it was, honestly, it was a pretty good year because I knew, you know, who I was. At the end of the year, all of my friends decided to try out for the dance team because the dance team at this school was a really big deal. There were 90 girls in the dance team. And when they lined up to do a high kick, they stretched from the 10-yard line to the other 10-yard line. So it was a big deal to be part of this group. 
And it wasn't really in my plans because my plans were to go and be in the varsity marching band. The varsity marching band at the school was really, really good. They won the state championship first place with their routine using the, the music from Dallas, the TV show. They actually spelled out J-R and shot him. So I wanted to be part of that. But I decided to try it for the dance team because all my friends were doing that. It seemed like fun. And I tried out, and I made it. And so did most of them. So that was fun. Over the summer, I had a little bit of a, of a glow up, as they say. I lost 15 pounds. I got contact lenses. And I got to go to school wearing the cute little uniform that was yellow and had brown rickrack. And we had sewn it ourselves. But I think we wore it with brown suede saddle shoes. But it was, it was still a mark of status to wear that weird little uniform to school. And all of a sudden, boys started paying attention to me. Not the cute boys, but boys. <laughs> and I started to take a few social risks that year. I went to a dance all by myself. I was certain my friend would change her mind and go, but no, she stuck by her guns and I went by myself and I had fun. So later in the year, it came time for the dance team to have their banquet and dance. And at the time, I had a crush on this guy whose name was Chris. And Chris was tall, dark, and handsome. He played basketball. He had floppy hair and tight jeans. And he was in the yearbook the year before under the words, most popular freshman boy. Clearly out of my league. But... His locker was near mine, and we would talk to each other every day. He would smile. He was super friendly. That's why he was the most popular. And we'd talk about the football game or the weather or whatever, and I said, I really like this guy. I'm going to ask him to the banquet. So one day I get my nerve up, and I, we're at the lockers. I say, hey, Chris, you know this uh, dance team banquet that's coming up? Do you want to go with me? And he said, Sure. What's your name? <sighs> so I told him my name, and I gave him my number. And wouldn't you know it, later in the week, he called me, and something had suddenly come up. Just like in the Brady Bunch with Marsha. But it's OK, because I went to the banquet with a senior who had his own truck. Thank you. And we had fun. And at the end of that year, I moved to a different town altogether. We moved to San Antonio. And at my new school, I joined the dance team there, too. And it was fine. The next year, my senior year, our basketball team was really, really good. And they went to the state championship tournament, which was in Austin. So we, to support them, we put on our matching sweatsuits with our name embroidered on the front. And we went to Austin in this big place at UT somewhere. And we were playing, not my old school, but we were playing a different Austin school. And this guy comes up. And he says, hey, come here. And I said, oh, I recognize this guy. He's my friend Penny's ex-boyfriend. He goes to the school that we're playing. So I walk across the aisle, and we have a little chat for like five or 10 minutes. And back in the days before social media, people used to exchange wallet photos. Do you remember those days, some of you? He asked me if I had a photo. And I said, well, let me check. And I look at my wallet. I did have one of my senior pictures. I gave it to him. We said goodbye. He left. I got back on the bus, and I realized it wasn't who I thought it was. That was Chris. <laughs> it was the guy that didn't know my name. He came up to me, and he asked me for a picture. And he knows my name now. <laughs> but in the meantime, I never saw him again, never talked to him again. But at my new school, I did meet this other guy named Chris, also tall, dark, and handsome, also popular, also athletic. And that relationship worked out better because today we have four grandchildren. <laughs> And he will always be known as the first Chris. <laughs>
Uh, what'd you think of that first half, Porter? I think they did a very, very excellent job of being so awkward. Let's give them a round of applause for our first four storytellers. All right. Porter, you want to tell us about our next storyteller? Our teller? next storyteller is San Juana Guillermo. San Juana has brought a story about the importance of names and how someone, how many people wanted to take away hers. Guys, let's give a warm welcome to San Juana. Hello, my name is San Juana Guillermo. No, I'm kidding, it's not. Oh, when my mom was pregnant with me, she was kind of sickly. And so she went to visit the Cathedral of the Virgen de San Juan. And she promised the Virgen that if we both survived, that she would name me after her. So San Juana it is, which I really hated. And I was really ashamed of my name when, when I was younger. So um, my parents are from Cotula, Texas. And the, com the La Tejano community there was mostly migrants, as were my parents. So they, when I was one year old, they went to the south of Chicago to work in a field, in a camp out there, and they ended up staying. So I grew up in Chicago Heights, in a Tejano community surrounded by my people. And they had no problem saying my name. All of them could say my name. The non-white, I mean, <laughs> the non-Spanish speaking, mostly white, just couldn't get it. They just couldn't say my name. They had problems with it. And when I was in seventh grade, I went to Catholic school, one and only year. And the nun there just didn't want to be troubled with my name. She wanted my bother, Sister Josetta. So what's your name? Uh, San Juana. So what does it mean in English? Uh, St. Jane, or well, from now on you'll be Jane. But I don't like Jane. Then you'll be Janie. <laughs> so it was. So I was Janie up until about my 20s, my early 20s. And when I was a teenager, I started working. My fellow workers um, would ask me about my name. And so I would tell them that I was named after a virgin. They would laugh. <laughs> they say, are you? <laughs> So basically, I thought about it. I thought, hey, I am the first, the original Jane the Virgin. <laughs> so, so um, yeah. And then I grew up. I got married. I was 30. We moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Latino community there was very diverse. There was um, Mexican-American, Mexican nationalists, Guatemaltecos, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans. And the Caribbeans would always call me Santa Juana. I don't know why. <laughs> the Mexican nationals would call me Sur Juana, like the famous nun from Mexico. And the Tejanos would call me San Juanita, which I really hated <laughs> that. So anyway, um, they had no problems with my name either, but the non-Spanish speaking, mostly white, had a lot of trouble. They just couldn't grasp my name. So what did they call you for short? San Juan, eh? <laughs> Oh, what is your nickname? Oh, San Juan. Eh? So sometimes I would try and help them out, and I would tell them, hey, you know, it's like San Juan, Puerto Rico, but with an A in the end, and everybody knows how to say San Juan, right? They'd always come back. Oh, you're Puerto Rican? <laughs> no, I'm not. Some wouldn't even try. They would just dismiss me completely, and they would say, oh, I'm not even going to bother with that because I'll never remember it. So I read or heard somewhere that when a person doesn't take the time to say your name, to pronounce your name, it's because you are not important to them. 
and they have no respect for you. And I believe that, okay? So, um, then I moved to San Antonio. And I was like music to my ears. <laughs> it was like everybody could pronounce my name and I didn't have to <laughs> enunciate it. I didn't have to spell it for them. And then I met her. <laughs> so my nephew invites me to his in-laws for Easter Sunday. And I'm introduced to his aunt-in-law, Lulu. And Lulu cannot say my name. Okay, San John, San Joa. So the day goes on and I'm coming in from the backyard and I bump into her and she starts again. Uh, she's really getting on my nerves now. <laughs> Not because she can't pronounce my name, but because she won't stop, okay? So then later on, we're in this group, and we're having this conversation, and uh, she said, and she started again, and then she said, oh, do you have a nickname? Like, oh, yeah, but it's only for family. <laughs> so, <laughs> so... <laughs> So then um, my sister-in-law, who was standing there with us, said with a little gleam in her eye, she said, you know, Lulu is not her real name. And I go, oh, so what's your real name? Oh, Juanita. <laughs> so then I, um, in a not so nice voice, I say, so you mean to tell me that your name is Juanita and you can't pronounce my name? <laughs> oh, yeah, they are somewhat alike, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, turn around and I looked at my sister-in-law. Now she's got a worried look on her face because <laughs> she knows me, okay? So I just shake my head and walked away. <laughs> Hello, my name is San Juana Guillermo. Thank you. Porter, do you have a name you don't like? I'm still thinking about how San Juana makes me laugh and she makes me cry. That's a, s <laughs> and her daughter and granddaughter. Aww. She had to see her grandma. All the, time. All the time. I don't like Vicky. <laughs> Can't stand Vicky. Like mm. I used to say, uh, it's gonna be Miss Vasquez or Tori. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my story. Oh. Mm. Oh. Next time. Aw, I thought there was going to be another reunion. Are you keeping her away? or? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we lost our chairs, Porter. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. That's a good give up. All right. We're going to keep it going with a couple more. Our next storyteller is Jack Schutze. Jack is here to share his story about he and his date had to roll with the punches after taking a huge spill. Let's put it together for Jack Schutte. In Texas, whenever you're talking about high school sweethearts, there's usually a bit of formality involved. There's moms for, hum moms for homecoming, dances, sometimes even coordinated school photos. My high school sweetheart and I, we met when we were 13 and dated all the way through senior year. Growing up in the suburbs, there's a lot of expectations of how to act and who to be. Contrarians at heart, we nearly rejected them all. I was into punk rock music. Most of my clothes were from Goodwill. They've been customized with kind of patches and Sharpies. She didn't really wear makeup or dresses and uh, always had dyed hair and was into this guy, Elliot Smith, before most people knew he existed. She even got to see him live. Our love and shared experiences created a strong bond. We fancied ourselves a modern-day Sid and Nancy, and it was us against the world. 
Senior year, while most of our peers were busy going to football games and out to house parties, she and I worked. We had jobs. With little or no interest in the daily happenings of our high school, our friends were the older co-workers at the pizza place we called home. For us, prom wasn't really in the cards. It wasn't even really in the deck. Our goal was to work as hard as we could so that when we graduated, we'd blast off from this little suburb into the great unknown, start our lives as delusional artists or nouveau hippies or something. <laughs> Looking back, we were insufferably naive and full of optimism, <laughs> which is a dangerous combination. Our parents were mostly hands-off with how we lived our lives, but prom was different. They launched a PR offensive that would rival a political ad campaign. <laughs> uh, you have to go to prom. It's your senior year. It's your last one. If you skip it, you'll, you'll regret it. And my favorite, all your friends will be there. <sighs> they finally just said something that broke our defenses. They go, if you go to prom, you can take the whole weekend off and we'll pay for the event. Uh, now we're talking, right? I was like... <laughs> A free ride to go crash this gaudy spectacle of excess? <laughs> if anything, we could just go for an hour and make snide comments to each other about the ridiculousness of it all. Either way, we were in. <laughs> Leading up to the event, she'd gone out and bought a light, uh, light brown satin dress that brought out the color of her eyes. Um, I rented a tux, and my accent colors matched her dress. It wasn't particularly fancy, but for us, it was like the lifestyles of the rich and famous. The night of, I headed over to her parents' house for the corsage presentation. Shortly thereafter, we were sent to be sacrificed to the gods of conformity, <laughs> also known as prom. <laughs> We'd picked a nice restaurant on the way to downtown that was famous for their fries, and it had a big open floor plan. The host sat us all the way in the back corner, but from our seats, we could see the entire bustling dining room. I loved her so much, and seeing her smile and formal wear was really tripping me out. <laughs> we were full of nervous energy, but doing our best to hide it. Once the appetizers of battered fries and homemade dipping sauce hit the table, we began to dig in and kind of relaxed a little bit. The tension was kind of cutting. And somewhere around that time, the server came to serve the table next to us. She took one item off the tray, destabilizing it, sending the entire table's order of food towards us. Food and plates smashed as they hit the table and the ground, and the food that did not hit the table or the ground landed directly on my date, right, right here. The whole restaurant fell completely silent as the waitress tried to dab up hamburger grease and aioli <laughs> from the now run dress. The silence started to fade as everyone was slowly like, it's their prom, it's their prom. <laughs> it got louder and louder, and the waitress actually ran off crying. I realized my date was in shock, and I saw her face change from like a blinding rage to resolute sadness. She leaned forward and quietly said, can we just leave? Which we did. We uh, escaped out the back door. On the way to the car, the manager chased us down, apologizing, and he gave me his card and said, you know, please call me when things calm down. Up until that point in my life, nothing had prepared me for this. Now I was in shock. In the car, we decided to just head straight to the prom. Maybe we'd get in, get out, no one would notice. <laughs> I really did, I felt, I hurt deeply for my partner in the passenger seat. She was always very proud and strong-willed, but of all the evenings, we sat there mostly quietly for the rest of the ride, just trying to reconcile what had happened. When we got to the prom, we smoked one rebellious cigarette in the parking lot, <laughs> gathered ourselves up, and headed indoors. Now, I don't know if you guys remember prom, but the first thing is always the photo booth. <laughs> they set it up to make sure you don't forget to take those future blackmail photos. <laughs> the photographer sees our predicament, immediately jumps into action, starts kind of moving us around. She goes, okay, maybe if she stands in the back, I'm 6'1". <laughs> then you're like, what about stomach to stomach? Let's do this weird... <laughs> And the conversation just got more and more awkward, and there's a line forming, and I wanted to get out of there. And suddenly, we bro both just kind of broke. We were like, we weren't even supposed to be at this damn thing. <laughs> and I feel bad for that photographer, but my date, dead on, looked straight into the camera and was just, take the picture. <laughs> at that point, something had broken. It was like this giant glass ball of expectations had been shattered. 
We no longer felt any obligation for our big night. Looking back, I think the accident at the restaurant is exactly what we needed. Once we addressed it and moved past it, we were allowed to be ourselves. We found the few people at the dance that we considered friends, told them about the story, laughed. We ate the food to replace our meal. We almost danced for 15 seconds. <laughs> but we had a great time. We had a great evening. And the next day, I called the restaurant. They gave us a, a full commercial cleaning of the dress, which did get the dresses out, or the stains out. And then they gave us a $250 gift certificate. So we spent that summer, every couple Tuesdays, <laughs> going out and eating at our now favorite restaurant. All right, thank you. The whole tray. Ugh. You know, I don't have to have a tray fall on me to feel awkward. <laughs> I can see that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I love giving you crap, Porter. It's yes. the best part of my job. A lot of it has landed on me <laughs> over these years. Yay. Well, this brings us to our final storyteller of the evening, Michelle Cantu. Michelle brings us a story, a understanding of a great embarrassment that she discovered was prompted by love. Let's all welcome to the stage, Michelle. Hey guys. So, when I was growing up, I thought that my mother was the most embarrassing person on the planet. And that was because she didn't do things like how the other mothers did. For example, if my friends had a boy over, their mothers would provide fancy snacks like crudite on things called Lazy Susans? <laughs> Not my mother. <laughs> Not that we would ever invite boys over because we knew better, but if a boy just so happened to come and knock on the door and ask to see us, my mother would chase them away with a chancla or a hanger a la mommy dearest. <laughs> but really, the trouble started when I was born. My mother got pregnant with me when she was 17. And when she got pregnant, my, mother, my father said, you know what? Deborah, I think it's time that you drop out. And so she did, but she decided, you know what? I'm going to keep going. I'm going to try again. So she went back to high school and then got pregnant again with my sister. So then my father says, really, Debbie, it's time to hang it up. You've got your domestic duties. So she says, OK, and then decides, no, I'm going to finish high school. So after a third try, my mother graduated with me and my sister there to witness her cross the stage. Which, give, it, give it up for my mom, that's amazing. <laughs> However, when I was growing up, I was just embarrassed. I just felt like I was the human personification of the scarlet letter of this big mistake. And so for me, it was always hard for me to kind of own that identity. My mother did this amazing thing, but I never appreciated it until I was much older. Then comes high school. While my other mom's friends are getting them set up to go to high schools in the neighborhoods that they grew up with, with all of their family and friends that look like them, my mother was pushing me to go to a magnet school. I want you to be a doctor, mija. I'm like, okay. So then I go to a high school where there's not a lot of people who look like me. And I just wanted to get by by minimizing my own Latinidad and not really owning who I was. Guys, I didn't even take Spanish in high school. I studied Latin for four years. That's a dead language. <laughs> but I make it through high school with very minimal hiccup. Come graduation time, 
you know, graduation is not fun. I don't think anyone really enjoys going to graduations. They're generally kind of long and boring. They last several hours. Now, the high school I went to was a small high school. Um, so there were several rules that they had in place to make sure that the event went off without a hitch. One of them was the number of tickets. Listen, you can only bring two people to the graduation. <laughs> Another rule was, hey, because we're trying to get through names and information, we want to limit noise makers for graduation. So no air horns, no cowbells, no maracas, which I felt like was very pointed at me. <laughs> but so I sat my mother down, I said, okay, mom, you gotta follow the rules on this one so that graduation goes off without a hitch. And she said, of course, mija, I will follow the rules. And to this day, she claims she does, but for those of you with Latina mothers know, they never follow the rules. <laughs> so because we went to a smaller high school, it wasn't just your name that was announced. They said your name, they said your GPA, they said like if you had scholarships, they said what school you were going to. So this is how the ceremony went for the person right before me. All right, next coming to the stage, 4.0 GPA, early acceptance to Johns Hopkins University, <laughs> Alan Brentwood. And then there are Alan's two parents. <laughs> Good job, Alan. <laughs> We're so proud of you. And then it's my turn. All right, next across the stage. She is in the bottom quartile of her class. <laughs> she is waitlisted at the local community college. <laughs> Michelle Cantu. And then what do you hear? <gasps> <laughs> Definitely more than two people, guys. <laughs> so there's a whole cheering section that pops up. And so I'm slinking into my chair like, oh, rule number one already broken. <laughs> but then I start to hear a noise that sounds like maracas. <laughs> and to this day, my mother says, listen, mija, I followed the rules because I didn't bring maracas. No, what my mother did was she made her own noisemaker that wasn't on the list. My mother took two milk jugs and put beans in them. <laughs> so next across the stage, Michelle Cantu. Ah, and then, <laughs> Guys, this is like some STEM level engineering stuff. I mean, you would have thought I would have had a higher GPA. But what Senora Cantu didn't do was tape the lid shut on the milk jugs. So here she is, ah, ja, 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 and then, and then, <laughs> beans go flying all over the audience. People are freaking out. Barbara, the Mexicans are throwing beans now. <laughs> I know they throw rice, it's just a matter of time before the beans. <laughs> Guys, and my last name is Cantu, so I'm at the very front of that graduation. So I'm just like slinking lower and lower into my seat, watching people pick freaking frijoles out of their hair. <laughs> After graduation is done, I go to my mother and I say, Mom, what happened? You had very specific instructions. And she said, to hell with those instructions, mija. I am proud of you. I, there was no way I was just gonna have two people come to your graduation. You are the first one in our family to be headed to college, waitlisted or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so proud of you and all that you've overcome. You graduated high school without having a baby too. And I was like, 
So from that moment on, I learned to appreciate and own my identity and just live in the moment and be proud of my mother, AKA Miss Milk Jugs. Thank you. Oh man, is Milk Jugs in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I thought for sure you were going to get her one last time. The rain I, of beans. I would have been there for it. I'd be like, get her. You know? <laughs> the hurricane of frijoles. Exactly. Yum. <laughs> Sounds delicious. You know, I like beans. You do? I, I like refried beans and borracho beans. I like charro beans. I like. But this is his Bubba Gump moment. <laughs> but but you know what? But I've never had a rain of beans. <laughs> I love your mom. I love your mom. And We're gonna hug her. Yes. It's gonna happen, Miss Jugs. I don't know. Is it Cantu? Uh, <laughs> should I be saying Miss Jugs? I feel weird. <laughs> that is your mom. <laughs> Guys, this has been worth repeating. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Please clap it up for all the storytellers you yeah. saw. Amazing. Amazing. Our next episode of Worth Repeating is Ghosted. We are still looking for storytellers, so if you have a story about ghosts or being ghosted, uh, like a relationship ghost, uh, <laughs> haunting your DMs, please, please submit at tpr.org backslash WR. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.